My paper will begin and end with Wentworth Castle, which is about 600 kilometres away from Utrecht, in the rolling countryside of South Yorkshire in the north of England. The English Heritage Register lists the place as Grade 1 due to the quality of the historic landscape that comprises 205 hectares of parkland, gardens, follies, mansion and home farm. However, the fabric of the estate fell into decline during the 20th century and in 2001, the Wentworth Castle Heritage Trust was set up to initiate the ambitious program of restoration that has brought the place back to life and opened it to the public for the first time in the long history of the estate. Funding has been generously provided by the Heritage Lottery Fund, as well as by the European Regional Development Fund and by English Heritage, among many other sources. The ongoing restoration has stimulated research into the iconography of the aristocrat who created the estate, which is where his weathered statue by John Michael Riseback still stands. This is Thomas Wentworth, 1st Earl of Strafford of the Second Creation. By 1717, contemporaries had acknowledged that Lord Strafford was creating Wentworth Castle as his monument. Closer examination has revealed that Strafford created the place as a monument to the Peace of Utrecht. Alongside John Robinson, Bishop of Bristol, Lord Strafford negotiated the Peace of Utrecht on behalf of Britain. Utrecht was a high point in his diplomatic career, an achievement that built on his success as ambassador in Berlin. Nonetheless, the era was marked by rival claims to the British throne, and Utrecht proved to have life-changing consequences for Strafford. On the premature death of Queen Anne in 1714, the new king, George I, and his Whig government were so hostile to the treaty that they purged the Tory ministers responsible with such brutality that Strafford was driven to change his allegiance and he became a Jacobite conspirator dedicated to the restoration of the exiled Stuart King James III. As we shall see, this new political affiliation spurred on his embellishment of Wentworth Castle as a monument to the peace of Utrecht. Today, the only survivor of Strafford's numerous lead garden statues is the figure of a kneeling male African supporting a sundial and known as the Blackamoor. What, though, was the connection between the peace of Utrecht and the Blackamoor? The answer had already been suggested by an incident during the mid-1980s that has become a local legend. The mansion at Wentworth Castle had become a college. And in the heightened political tension of the time, some of the students painted the black statue white as a gesture of ethnic reversal in order to make a political statement about Britain's historical role in the Atlantic slave trade. And for 30 years, the white blackamoor has been absent in storage. I hope to demonstrate that the meanings attributed to the blackamoor in 18th century Britain validate the perception of the students in the 1980s. Like all cast lead statues, the Blackamoor was designed to be replicated and versions were produced over a period of 70 years by the sculptors John Nost I, John Nost II on the left, circa 1720, Andrew Carpenter on the right, circa 1731, and John Cheer, often using the original moulds made to cast the first Blackamoor Garden statue in 1701. Moreover, anecdotal evidence suggests that Blackamoor was the most popular of all the lead garden statues manufactured in Britain during the 18th century. Although I have recorded the existence of at least 25, there are many others yet to be rediscovered. 
of these 25, 11 remain in English gardens. And the challenge for spectators of the Blackamoor today is to grasp the fact that until the late 18th century, most Britons had a positive attitude to African slavery. I must add that this research was stimulated by the challenge of interpreting the Wentworth Blackamoor to the visiting public. In the process, I became aware that in Britain, heritage sites tend to omit reference to any connection with the Atlantic slave trade. Nonetheless, of the two principal institutions responsible for Britain's heritage sites, English Heritage and the National Trust, English Heritage has begun to engage with the connections between some of its properties and the slave trade. I eagerly await the publication next week by English Heritage of the book Slavery and the British Country House, which contains the proceedings of the conference held at the London School of Economics in 2009. The National Trust was the co-sponsor of the 2009 conference, yet the interpretation of the four National Trust gardens that I shall refer to appears to contradict the 2009 aspiration to highlight connections between National Trust properties and the Atlantic slave trade. One example is the recent article in Country Life magazine about the National Trust garden at West Green House in Hampshire. The double page photograph here positions the Blackamoor in the foreground. Yet the caption to the photograph directs the reader to another feature altogether. It reads, beyond the box hedges, the Rococo Chinois chicken coop. And the omission of any reference to the statue in the caption and article implies that it is regarded merely as decorative staffage. Another example is the plaque placed by the National Trust during 2011 beside the Blackamoor at Dunham Massey in Cheshire outside Manchester. It reads, this sundial is in the style of one commissioned by William III. It represents one of the four continents known at the time. The figure depicts a moor, not a slave, and has knelt here since before 1750. When <laughs> George Booth, second Earl of Warrington, inherited Dunham Massey in 1694, the place was so impoverished that to restore the estate, he married the trade heiress, Mary Oldbury. And the Blackamoor was installed circa 1735 when the mansion had been rebuilt. Instead of denying any association with slavery, it would be helpful if the National Trust was to undertake research to identify the commercial source of Mary Oldbury's wealth, which, as we shall see, might well account for the presence of the Blackamoor. All the evidence available indicates that these Blackamoor statues were perceived by contemporaries as representations of slaves, even though the original of 1701 was intended to depict the figure of Africa in the allegorical group of the four continents. Needless to say, the Blackamoor at Wentworth Castle was integral to Lord Strafford's celebration of Utrecht. First, though, I shall consider the relationship of the Blackamoor to the geopolitical associations of the four continents in the royal commemorations of the Peace of Utrecht in London, outside St. Paul's Cathedral, at Hampton Court Palace, and at the Royal Naval Hospital, Greenwich. The National Memorial to the Peace of Utrecht stands in front of St. Paul's Cathedral. The peace conference was convened in 1711, and the treaty ratified in 1713 to conclude the 11-year-long War of Spanish Succession. Modern historians have acknowledged the Peace of Utrecht as a diplomatic coup that proved to be the catalyst to British ascendancy as a maritime and colonial power. Even though the war was largely fought in Europe, Britain gained territory in Canada and the Caribbean from France, as well as strategic Mediterranean naval bases from Spain. However, British histories 
seldom acknowledge the role of the Peace of Utrecht in British dominance of the Atlantic slave trade. Through securing the Spanish Asiento de Negros, Britain acquired the monopoly contract to transport African slaves to Spain's New World Empire in the Caribbean, Central America, and the South American continent. Yet the Utrecht Memorial is now known as the Queen Anne Monument, and I suspect that the absence of any textual reference to Utrecht is due to the hostility of the Queen's successors to the peace treaty. Nonetheless, the monument is a triumphant commemoration of Utrecht, executed by the sculptor Francis Bird. The figure of the modern queen presides over classically dressed personifications of Britannia, France, Ireland, and America. Britannia, on the left, is crowned with the laurel wreath of victory and holds a trident to proclaim maritime supremacy while the presence of America on the right acknowledges colonial expansion and the destination of the Asiento slaves. Note that the attributes of the continent include a severed European head and miniature alligator. The popularity of the Blackamoor marked the years of Britain's engagement with the Asiento and continued into the 1770s. I shall discuss the contemporary perception of the statue as an affirmation of commercial prosperity ensured in particular by the Spanish Asiento and in general by the Atlantic slave trade. Winning the Asiento had been an aim since the outbreak of war in 1702, and its award to Queen Anne at the Peace of Utrecht in 1713 realized a long-standing trade aspiration. The Asiento required the delivery of 4,800 Africans each year for a period of 30 years. Even though historians debate whether the Asiento was a profitable form of slave trading for Britain, the government seems to have regarded it as, a worth, as worthwhile because it provided British merchants with unprecedented access to Spanish colonial markets. In fact, instead of relinquishing the Asiento in 1743, the contract was renewed at the Peace of Aix-la-Chapelle in 1748, and then in 1750, it was sold back to Spain, doubtless because British commerce had successfully penetrated Spanish colonial markets. Although the Asiento was awarded to the monarch at the Peace of Utrecht, the operation of the contract was carried out by two slaving companies. The pre-existing Royal Africa Company acquired the Asiento slaves in West Africa, marshaled them in the company's coastal slave forts and sold them to the South Sea Company. The South Sea Company was set up by the British government with the purpose of buying the Asiento slaves and transporting them across the Atlantic for resale in the Spanish New World. British slave trading expanded rapidly. Before Utrecht in 1710, British merchant ships were annually transporting 125,000 African slaves. After Utrecht, 1720, this figure had increased to 210,000 annually. And by 1739, it had more than doubled to 300,000 a year. These figures combine the Asiento slaves with those transported to British colonies and to the colonies of other European maritime powers. British involvement in slave trading had begun in the 1560s and increased from the 1650s when African slaves were introduced into Britain's Caribbean sugar plantations and the tobacco plantations of the southern colonies in North America and it accelerated throughout the 1700s until 1807 when Parliament outlawed British participation in the slave trade. Between 1660 and 1807, the British were the dominant Atlantic slave traders. <laughs> 
In the late 1990s, it was thought that British merchant ships transported three and a half million Africans. However, this figure had almost doubled by 2007 when in the bicentenary of the Slave Trade Abolition Act, the British government's website acknowledged six million or half of the estimated 12 million enslaved Africans transported to the Americas. Until abolition, the Atlantic slave trade and the slave economy were regarded as valuable economic assets by government and commercial interests alike, and by investors as a source of many lucrative commodities. The slave economy offered investment opportunities in shipping, in services to the colonial plantations and their owners, and in the produce of slave labor. For example, sugar, cotton, rum, coffee, tobacco, molasses, and mahogany. Investors were drawn from every section of polite society, from the middle classes, the gentry, the aristocracy, the royal family, and the monarch. As a result, there are overt connections between the Atlantic slave trade, the slave economy, and the art favored by the British elite, including the gardens embellished by the blackamoor. The original Blackamoor statue derived from the figure of Africa, which was integral to the Baroque allegory of the four continents. These female personifications and their attributes represented the parts of the world known to Europeans, with Europe... Can you see that? Oh. Can you see an arrow? Oh, well, there we are. Europe. That one there. Oops. There we go. Europe with the horse at the pinnacle of the hierarchy, followed by Asia to the right there with the camel. I've lost my... Oh, there we are. Okay, Asia. Both of whom are sumptuously dressed, while the relative nakedness of Africa... Oh, there we are, yes. <laughs> of Africa with the lion and America with the deer and the teeny-weeny alligator <laughs> articulated the perception that these continents were both uncivilized and barbarous. In the context of trade rivalry and imperial warfare, these figures were used by the European maritime powers as symbols of each continent offering up its produce. As, for example, to Amsterdam, personified in the center of the relief on the west pediment of Amsterdam Old Town Hall, 1664. Let me see. There. By Artus Quilinus the Elder and recorded in the engraving of 1669 by the sculptor's brother, Hubertus Quilinus. From left to right, we see America here. Asia here, and Europe here, and Africa here. The commerce in African slaves was usually implicit, so the Amsterdam pediment proves to be unusually explicit because the figure of America, which you can see below, can be seen leading a bound African slave while others toil in silver mines. The four continents were integral to the didactic royal allegories created during and after the War of Spanish Succession at Hampton Court Palace and the Royal Naval College, Greenwich, between 1701 and 1727. With Baroque exuberance, they proclaimed Britain as a triumphant nation whose prosperous commercial empire was secured by the Peace of Utrecht, by maritime supremacy, and by the Protestant succession of monarchs. The painted hall at Greenwich is by St. James Thornhill. And the ceiling of the upper hall depicts Queen Anne in the central medallion, crowned by Victory, who hovers above her holding a laurel wreath, and accompanied by the virtues and saluted by the four continents. You can see Europe at the bottom here. And in, the, in a similar relationship, you can see Asia to the right, 
and America to the left, and Africa above. Note the attributes of Africa that include the lion and the headdress of an elephant's head. Is it coincidence that Africa is placed opposite the mural that portrays the Hanoverian royal family? And that King George I is depicted beside a globe, as you can see right at the bottom here. And that the globe is situated at the eye level of the viewer and that it clearly re reveals the Atlantic Ocean bordered by the continents of Europe, Africa, and America. Europe is up here. As Ooh. Europe, America, and Africa. And that West Africa is predominant in this geography and that West Africa was the source of the slaves acquired to supply the Spanish asiento that had been won at Utrecht. The triangularity of the Af Atlantic slave trade was attractive because it enabled profitable cargoes to be carried on each stage of the voyage. British goods were shipped to West Africa, slaves were transported across the Atlantic, and the highly prized produce of the Caribbean and the Americas was then shipped to Britain. It was at Hampton Court Palace in 1701 that the Blackamoor was installed as part of an allegorical program that also juxtaposed the British monarch with the four continents. This was the first of the Blackamoor statues and it was created by John Nost I for King William's Privy Garden. John Nost I customized the figure of Africa and created a new hybrid distinct from the lead statues that relied on historical models from Italy and Flanders. Nost's statue is of a kneeling rather than a standing figure and it is male rather than female. Nost had combined two forms that were familiar from King William's Dutch palace at Het Lu, the kneeling boy or putty continents that supported the terrestrial globe in the Baroque garden. The terrestrial globe is here, here in the Baroque garden, and on the top left you can see, a, you can just see a detail of it, you might just be able to see the putty, the boys kneeling supporting the globe. And combine these kneeling boys with the adult male Atlantes that illusionistically support the ceiling of the royal audience chamber. And you can see an example of an Atlante there. During 1701, the Blackamoor on the left here and its companion, the Indian slave, were installed at Hampton Court Palace as representations of Africa and Asia. 1701 was the year the Spanish Asiento was awarded to Louis XIV of France. King William III regarded this award as symptomatic of the dangers inherent in the accession of the grandson of Louis XIV to the throne of Spain as Philip V and the war of Spanish succession was fought by the Grand Alliance to frustrate the attempt by the French king to unite the crowns, territories, and empires of France and Spain. Although removed long ago, it was re recorded that Nost's statues of the Blackamoor and the Indian slave were positioned below the terrace steps so that these representations of Africa and Asia knelt before the British monarch whose private chamber overlooked them from the first floor of the palace, as reconstructed here for the book published in 2011, The Blackamoor and the Georgian Garden. In effect, these continents were created as a manifesto of Britain's geopolitical aims in the war later concluded at Utrecht. With the premature death of William III, in 1702, this sculptural set of the four continents remained incomplete. As an economy measure, Queen Anne cancelled the sculpture program for the gardens. Nonetheless, she immediately commissioned a mural 
version from the painter Antonio Verrio to adorn the Queen's drawing room. And just like the Blackamoor and the Indian slave, these traditionally female figures kneel before the British monarch and offer their produce. From the left, America, here, offers pearls and tobacco. Then Asia, here, offers a censer of aromatic spices, while Europe, here, offers the crown and scepter of monarchy. Africa, on the right, is characteristically identified by the headdress of an elephant's head, yet the kneeling Africa offers nothing other than herself. Her own body appears to be the embodiment of her population. Instead of produce, the Blackamoor and the Indian slaves supported sundars that offered up geographical time through association with the continents of Africa and Asia. Other contemporary British sundials offered an overt conjunction of time, geography, and trade. For example, the inscription on the garden sundial, 1736, at Cannon Hall in Yorkshire, neighbor to Wentworth Castle, encompasses trading ports of the new and old worlds, Boston in New England and Constantinople. The sundial at Belton Hall in Lincolnshire, another National Trust property, encompasses all the continents. It is supported by a sculptural group by Kaya Sibber, circa 1695, comprising a column held by Father Time, seated on a globe and assisted by a putto. The dial is inscribed with the time and place at noon at key sites of British trade. Constantinople, Lisbon, Moscow, Isfahan, Peking, Mexico, Fort St. George, now Madras in India, and at either end of the Atlantic slave trade, Barbados, on Barbados, which you can see on the left, and a British Caribbean plantation colony, and Ferdinando Isle, on the right, a strategic center of West African enslaving, now Bioko in Equatorial Guinea. Both the Blackamoor on the left and the Indian slave on the right became fashionable due to their origins in the influential royal garden at Hampton Court Palace. Yet it was the Blackamoor that was preferred by the monarch's elite subjects while the Blackamoor's companion statue was known as the Indian slave from the moment of its creation in 1701. By 1705, the sculptor John Nost I was describing the Blackamoor itself as a slave. Paradoxically, these descriptions contradict the depictions. The Blackamoor is not depicted with any of the attributes of slavery, as can be seen by comparison with two interior sculptures that were created as representations of slaves. One is the exotically dressed portrait bust on the right by John Nost I, 1700, of an African servant favored by King William III. It's now in Kensington Palace, London, and, it, and the figure bears the characteristic slave collar around the neck. William III had grown up with the presence of African servants at the Dutch court and also owned sugar plantations and their slaves. The other is, the ex is from the exquisite pair of polychromatic figures at Durham Park, Gloucestershire, another National Trust property. These, one of them is on the left there, are shackled with the collar and chains of a slave. They are posed in the same kneeling posture as the Blackamoor Garden statue, but support exotic seashells on their heads to hold torchères. These are in the private study of the owner, William Blaithwaite, who was King William III's Minister of War and had oversight of the government's colonial administration. Nevertheless, the Blackamoor statues were described as slaves in garden inventories and by garden visitors, as well as by the sculptor John Nost I. And use of the words Negro, African, and kneeling slave reinforced the association with the African slave, the Atlantic slave trade. The Blackamoor populated the fashionable modern gardens made for aristocratic, gentry, and bourgeois landowners. These men were courtiers, merchants, politicians, and soldiers. 
it is perhaps a surprise for today's visitor to appreciate that garden statues were originally resonant with associative, even didactic meaning that articulated the geopolitical interests of the patriotic Britain for whom the splendor of the garden's tranquil retreat was designed. Nonetheless, when the Blackamoor is considered alongside its companion statues, the iconography that emerges is one of patriotic commemoration of warfare, peace, and trade. For example, the presence of the Blackamoor at a different Hampton Court on the edge of Wales acknowledged not only the modernity of Thomas Coningsby, first Earl of Coningsby, but also the benefit of the income of his father-in-law, Ferdinando Gorges, who was a Barbados merchant and renowned as a notorious slaver. At Cannons, the, notor the notoriously opulent estate created for James Bridges, first Duke of Chandos outside London, the Blackamoor statue was recorded in 1725 as a Negro slave. Chandos had made his fortune during the War of Spanish Succession as paymaster to Queen Anne's army and amplified his wealth with income from shares in British and French slaving companies, such as the Royal Africa Company, the South Sea Company, and the Mississippi Company. The Blackamoor also graced the gardens of at least three directors of the South Sea Company, which specialized in transporting the Asiento slaves to Spanish America. One was for Arthur Moore at Fetcham Park, Surrey, another for Francis Hawes at Purley Hall, Berkshire, and a third for John Gore at Bushhill Old Park, Enfield, outside London. The Blackamoor for Sir Dudley North at Glemham Hall, Suffolk, embellished a garden that was also created by mercantile wealth derived from the East India Company as well as the Levant trade. Many gardens saluted British warfare and trade through statues of military heroes, such as Queen Anne's army commander, the Duke of Marlborough, on the left, alongside the Blackamoor. Others commemorated the wartime alliance between France through the statue of Prince Eugene, on the right, commander of the Austrian imperial armies, in company with the Duke of Marlborough and the Blackamoor. I'm speeding ahead. <laughs> so, Marlborough on the left, Eugene on the right, the Blackamoor in the centre. Other gardens, here we go. So have we digested this? Because I'm moving on again now. Other gardens favoured a classical muscularity, as, for example, at Nunnington Hall, Yorkshire, where the Blackamoor on the right was accompanied by Mars, god of war, on the left, in company with Apollo, the archer, in the centre, and Diana, the huntress, as well as the maritime deity, Neptune. Although at least 11 of the Blackamoor statues have survived in English gardens, only two of these places at present provide substantial case studies. One is Melbourne Hall, Derbyshire, which is a rare example of an early 18th century garden where the collection of lead statues remains intact. And the other is Wentworth Castle, Yorkshire, which was embellished after the war by Lord Strafford, one of the two British diplomats who negotiated the Peace of Utrecht. The creator of Melbourne Hall was the politician and court official Thomas Coke, who stood at the heart of government. He had a keen interest in diplomatic and military affairs and was engaged in colonial policy and administration. He was an advisor to Queen Anne, a political colleague to her successful general, the Duke of Marlborough, and enjoyed an intimate knowledge of the royal palaces at Hampton Court in England and Het Loo in Holland. Indeed, as at Hampton Court, the kneeling continents of Africa, the Blackamoor, on the far left here, and Asia, the Indian slave, on the far right, face the mansion and offer up their produce to Britain. The development of the garden matched the progress of the war. In 1704, Coke became, began to create the terraced parterres. 1704 was marked by the Duke of Marlborough's victory at Blenheim and Coke's own appointment to the government's colonial administration. 
in 1706. The parterres were adorned with statues commissioned from the same John Nost one who had originally created the Blackamoor and the Indian slave for Hampton Court Palace. 1706 saw the victories of Marlborough at Ramillies and of Prince Eugene at Turin, as well as Coke's appointment to government. In 1711, when the birdcage arbor was completed by Robert Bakewell, the war was at stalemate and the peace conference was convened at Utrecht. At Melbourne Hall, the Blackamoor and the Indian slave are unique among all the garden statues of kneeling Africans, of kneeling slaves. Both Africa and Asia offer up not geographical time, They offer up not geographical time in the form of a sundial, but identical urns decorated with motifs that depict tropical produce. The flame of the usual Baroque flambeau has been replaced with an exotic fruit resembling a melon, and the relief depicts putty and junior satires frolicking amidst Caribbean fruits such as pineapples, coconuts, and I think bananas. The central figure of Mercury, god of trade, links these continents with the features that enact classical myth as a parallel between the ancient world of the warrior hero and the modernity of a prosperous Britain. These are the birdcage arbor beyond the pool, flanked by the statues of Perseus and Andromeda. I'm sure you're all familiar with the myth of Perseus, doubtless from the 1981 Hollywood movie, Clash of the Titans, the final work of the legendary Ray Harryhausen, or from the inferior 2010 remake of the same name. The myth recounts the hero's exploits when the gods empowered him to slay the snakehead Gorgon Medusa, whose gaze turned all organic matter to stone. With the advantages of flight and invisibility, of the mirror shield and the adamantine sword, Perseus decapitated the Gordon, Gorgon and then encountered the princess Andromeda. She was sacrificially chained to a rock to appease the sea monster who was terrorizing her parents' kingdom. Unveiling the Gorgon's head, Perseus turned the creature to stone. The myth of Perseus was attractive because it could be used to signify the bringing of peace to regions laid waste by destructive forces, as represented by the Gorgon and the sea monster. In the garden at Melbourne Hall, the imposing classical statues of the martial warrior and the vulnerable princess are complemented by the water of the pool that suggests ocean and the polychromatic ironwork of the birdcage arbor that bears the grotesque mask that intimates the presence of the sea monster. Perseus becomes the embodiment of British endeavor that liberates the continent of Europe, personified by Andromeda, from the monstrous tyranny of France through the restoration of peace. The relationship of the Blackamoor and the Indian slave to the classical statues articulated the familiar endorsement of war, peace, and trade in which Britain was hailed as the savior of Europe, reaping the rewards of peace through the bounty of Africa and Asia. The Blackamoor was also among the garden statues installed at Wentworth Castle by Lord Strafford, who developed his country estate as a monument to the peace of Utrecht. His Baroque palace was conceived as an ambassadorial mansion and designed when he was in Berlin by the Prussian court architects Jean de Bott and Johann Eosander. The structure had been erected by 1714, the year of his political downfall, after which Strafford, now a Jacobite conspirator, must have relished his emphatic commemoration of the great diplomatic achievement of the reign of the Stuart Queen Anne, because both the Peace of Utrecht and the Stuart Royal Dynasty were despised by the imported Hanoverian monarchy and its Whig governments. Between 1717 and 1734, Strafford's symbolic eulogy encompassed the mansion's interior, the gardens, and the parkland. His, icon his iconographic centerpiece is the plasterwork allegory of peace 
Conquering War, 1729 to 31, by Francesco Vasali in the stairwell of the Italian staircase. Once again, the myth of Perseus was deployed, this time to allegorize Strafford's achievement as Queen Anne's peacemaker at Utrecht. In the first medallion on the right, Perseus stands holding in one hand the adamantine sword and in the other the severed head of the snake-head Gorgon Medusa. On the ground lies Minerva's mirror shield that enabled Perseus to approach the Gorgon without being turned to stone. The other medallion on the left depicts fame with her attribute of the trumpet supporting Minerva's shield, ornamented this time with the Gorgon's head. The theme of peace and plenty pervades the interior and was complemented by the profusion, I'll get the hang of this soon, by the profusion of fruits and vegetation carved in high relief by Daniel Harvey on the facade of the mansion. Two minutes right. These statues are the same as those chosen for the medal struck to commemorate the ratification of the peace. After Strafford was dismissed from government in 1714, he relied exclusively on personal wealth to embellish Wentworth Castle, and all his income was substantially derived from slave trading and the slave economy. So he not only negotiates the acquisition of, uh, of the Asiento, but his income derives equally from slave trading and the slave economy. This was not unique to Strafford, I stress that. Rather, Strafford was representative of contemporary Britons, and certainly those who displayed the blackamoor. Strafford did not own slaves, nor participate in slave trading. However, he was a keen investor in the South Sea Company, the East India Company, and the Mississippi Company. And in 1720, he was rewarded by the French government for his Jacobite mission to Paris with further shares in the Mississippi Company. Moreover, the greatest part of his income was acquired through his father-in-law, Sir Henry Johnson, who was a shipbuilding magnate. Not only did the merchant ships he built work the Atlantic trade, but he was also a director of the East India Company and a representative of the Royal Africa Company. Furthermore, it is thought that Johnson's wealth was fueled by the inheritance from his father, who in turn had accumulated it while a factor of the Royal Africa Company based in one of the West African coastal slave forts. Thus, the wealth Strafford acquired through marriage to Anne Johnson in 1711 and later by inheritance during the 1720s was suffused with the profits of slavery. And what became of all the Blackamoors? Lead garden statues became unfashionable unfashionable in the 1780s, which was a decade in which the movement to abolish the slave trade began to gather momentum. This might, the popularity of the statue might account for the kneeling African becoming an emblem of the abolitionist movements and the emancipation movement in the 1830s and continuing through the 19th century. And so, to conclude, Strafford continues to commemorate the Peace of Utrecht into the 1730s, and we can possibly see on the left, in the left-hand wilderness, the kneeling figure of the Blackamoor, perhaps. But the final question is, what of the white Blackamoor at Wentworth Castle? This summer, to mark the 300th anniversary of the Peace of Utrecht, the restored Blackamoor will be returned to the garden and installed within the Victorian Conservatory, which, as I speak, is itself under restoration. And at that point when it's installed, the project perhaps really begins. Thank you. Well, thank you, Patrick, for your uh, very interesting scholarly and richly illustrated uh, presentation about the Blackamoor Garden statue and its slave trade uh, connotations. Um, as you stated this, well, I, I think I shouldn't look at you. Uh, I learned that from uh, Gert. Uh, as you stated, uh, 
this particular blackamoor uh, in the gardens of Wentworth Castle, as well as his at least 25 brothers in other English gardens, stand for the fact that until the 18th, the late 18th century, uh, most Britons had a positive attitude to slavery. I think that wouldn't be very different from the Dutch Republic, from the Netherlands in those days. It might even be so that the black man after whom this lead statue was made had been born or at least had lived uh, as an enslaved African on a Dutch Caribbean plantation. The Orange family, the royal, now royal family, the Orange family was famous for its black servants, as you might know. There are a number of fascinating paintings in Dutch and British museums of William III, your King William III, um, served or accompanied by a black servant. And the same goes for his mother, Mary Henrietta Stuart, as well as his aunt, Mary of Orange, as well as his grandmother, Amelia van Solms, to name just a few of his contemporary relatives. And his successor's son, William V in the Netherlands, even was accompanied um, from his early childhood on with two or by two uh, black servants named Cupid and Cedron. And he even took them with him to England when he, when he had to go into exile in 1795. Uh, and we have several portraits of these two, uh, Cupid and Cedron, these two servants. What is much lesser known about King William III and his showing off with blacks was his arrival in Exeter in 1688. And if you allow me, I would like to quote from a description called A True and Exact Relation of the Prince of Orange, his public entrance into Exeter. And I quote, since the foundation of monarchy, imperial orations or the triumphs of the Caesars in the manner, grandeur, and magnificence of their most sumptuous, sumptuous cavalcades, there was never any that exceeded this of the most illustrious hero, the Prince of Orange, his entrance into Exeter, which was in manner and form following. First, the Right Honorable, the Earl of Macclesfield, with 200 horses, the most part of which were English gentlemen, richly mounted on Flanders steeds, managed and used to war in headpieces, back and breast, bright armor. Second, and here it comes, 200 blacks brought from the plantations of the Netherlands in America, embroidered caps lined with white fur and plumes of white feathers to attend the horse. And then it goes on and on with all kinds of other exotic uh, uh, figures um, in his party. Why am I telling you this story? Um, about orange monarchs and their showing off uh, with blacks? Well, in the first place, to indicate that the influence of the Dutch in, English, in England in those days might have been as much black as orange. <laughs> More important, however, is that I'm intrigued by the blackamoors of those days, the blackamoors you told us so eloquently about. Uh, not only as a metaphor or a statement, but the Blackamoor as a person, a person with a story. With that, I actually mean three things. First of all, I think it's absolutely correct that, as you uh, stated, the Blackamoor was eventually linked to slavery. However, the beautifully dressed servants, which remind in the Netherlands a bit of the figure of Zwarte Piet, Black Piet, um, these servants in the paintings I mentioned, uh, nor these nicely sculptured kneeling figures of a black man with a sundial, told the story of slavery. They told what is sometimes described as the white man's dream never achieved. Depictions like these covered up the real story. They silenced the story of human trafficking, 
of extreme exploitation. And therefore, it was not so hard for Britons or Dutch to have a positive attitude towards slavery. They created, with blackamoors like these and other uh, depictions, their own world, their own reality, their own depiction of slavery. Secondly, I wonder who was the person who may have modeled for John Michael Reisbrecht, the creator of this particular uh, blackamoor in Wentworth uh, Gardens. This black man may have been born on a Dutch Caribbean plantation and he may have told Reisbrecht his personal story while modeling for him. Did Reisbrecht work personal elements of this story into the statue? Can the identity of the model and his personal story be unraveled? What would that story tell that the lad Blackamore does not tell? Would it add or even replace the piece of Utrecht connotations by, for instance, maroon war connotations in, for example, Jamaica and Suriname? Thirdly, I also mean with this personal story of the Blackamore, the stories attributed to or the meanings derived from the statue. You explained its iconical function in the days of the Asiento and the Peace of Utrecht. However, you also pointed at the mid-1980s when students wanted to uncover Britis, Britain's role in slavery by painting the Blackamoor white. And you also suggested that the kneeling Blackamoor might have been a model for the emblematic kneeling black man almost beggingly stating, am I not a man and a brother? So what intrigues me is, what was the Blackamoor story between abolitionism and anti-slavery on the one hand and student protests two centuries later on the other? Was his story another story of silencing the past? Did he contribute to post-slavery amnesia? Was he the white man's burden in a colonized piece of nature we now call garden? What did he in evoke in the inhabitants of Wentworth Castle and other places and pa uh, palaces? Patern paternalistic charity? Subdued sexuality? Fear for black Uhuru? And finally, does Blackamoor have offspring in the present, and what is his or her story? Maybe the Blackamoor was not referring to peace or to slavery at all, after all. Thank you. I'll give also the opportunity for a short response, and then we will continue with a question and answers. Very short. The first thing I'd like to say is, can you send, email me your comments? Because they were fascinating. The, the, the continuing life of the Blackamoor is fascinating. What will it mean? What did it mean to different people at different times? And indeed, what will it mean to people visiting Wentworth Castle from, 2040, from 2013 onwards, from 2014 onwards, once it is in situ? That is a big question, and it's been quite a substantial decision taken to restore it. There was a huge anxiety about the potential responses to the Blackamoor, and indeed the restorers made a, a very particular decision because most statues of the Blackamoor have been painted just a standard black. And yet they decided to look at portraits of Africans by 18th century English painters such as Gainsborough and Reynolds and Hogarth and to try to derive the pigmentation from those 18th century paintings. And when I showed photographs of the restored Blackamoor to all our supporters, our friends and volunteers, they were first of all horrified that we were going to redisplay the Blackamoor and secondly, they realized that their horror was at the fact that it had somehow taken a life other than being a statue because the pigmentation was, to, in their eyes, more realistic than the previous jet black of its previous existences. 
And they finally, after an hour of discussion, concluded that it was that that would engage a viewer because the statue had become endowed with humanity, if you like. So I don't know. So there's all sorts of things could happen once we've restored it. These are just some very recent reactions to the, the, the presence of the statue. Thank you. Thank you so much. The floor is open for your questions. Yes. Tea in life when you wait long enough, <laughs> it appears. Well, first of all, my name is Viman Hutu. Thank you very much for a very interesting uh, presentation. I was just wondering, um, the wealth of your presentation and also the response by Professor uh, Alex von Stiprian indicates that, of course, contextualization and uh, adding information towards heritage sites and statues and such is crucial. And I was wondering, in, in the beginning of your presentation, you, you mentioned this conference and, and the book that is coming out, and, you, and that was very intriguing. You said, well, I'm not quite sure what these two big heritage organizations, the Heritage and, and the Trust, will actually do with the outcomes of, of that conference. And could you please elaborate somewhat more on that? Can you hear me with this? Oh, yes. It's a big question. I think one thing I was trying to demonstrate was that the relationship between the Atlantic slave trade and the British elite was total. And so all the country houses in Britain, you could almost put money on the fact that they will have been developed through either investment in the slave economy or directly through sl the slave trading. Yet there is an extraordinary atmosphere of denial in the heritage industry. I mean, I'm ever so envious of people in universities undertaking research and sharing that research with networks such as yourselves, but in the heritage industry in Britain, it's silent. Don't mention it. And one of the, perhaps, the downturns of the work I've been doing has produced a denial in the National Trust already because that plaque placed by the Blackamoor outside Manchester is as, a as is, is as a direct result of the questions from myself and my fellow researcher trying to ask the National Trust, what do you think this statue means? And instead of engaging in discussion, they put a plaque up saying that it is, is not a slave, which I was <laughs> rather disappointed by. So the work is, par is partly spurred on by trying to see if we can initiate some discussion within the heritage industry. And with the book that's coming out, I was delighted to see that it's actually been published by English Heritage, and the National Trust has no logo on it at all. And that seems to say an enormous amount about who is going to support some perhaps tentative exploration of connections between these country houses and the Atlantic slave trade and institutions that are not prepared to at all. Now, it would be great if the National Trust did come to its senses, but I suspect the reason it isn't is more down to what Esther Cass Captain was saying at the beginning about economies and the current climate. Sadly, the National Trust, because of the pressure to so to, to make all these properties, all these country houses, financially self-sustaining has tended to favor the employment of people who know about tourism and bringing people into the property as opposed to the historians. And the historians and curators that worked for the National Trust have by and large all lost their jobs. So we see those people with expertise to excavate the history of properties no longer are employed and those who are there are there to ensure that the property becomes financially sustainable and I think this is a process that has been happening in the last three or four years ever since the National Trust had a major reorganization three years ago. 
English heritage is trying hard, and they have, a, they, they have published online accounts of four of their properties so far. And this book, obviously, takes the analysis further. Thank you. Um, you want to react to Yes. Um, yeah, well, uh, two uh, reactions uh, to that. Uh, the same happens here. I will be fired in two months, so <laughs> from the museum. Um, but the, the first uh, one is you, you um, said that the, the, the Heritage Foundations and, and professionals are uh, silencing uh, uh, about the past. And um, that happened right after the commemorations of 2007 that you had the conference and that the book uh, was coming out, so there was not a single influence from the commemorations at all. No, no. Meaning we are now in our year of commemoration, and what would be your recommendation to us? Well, one of the really, dis I mean, it's a, it's a small point, this, but um, countries like to, to publish stamps to commemorate occasions, postage stamps. Mind you, we're all on email these days, so perhaps it doesn't work. But, but there was a, a, a group who were trying to get the Royal Mail in England to publish stamps with heroes and heroines of emancipation, people you know, from Africa, people from the Caribbean, people from the UK, and it never happened. And that was just one little symptom of the, the absence of, of any movement at all. Except, except in this organisation called English Heritage, where there has been some move. But even English Heritage has had its budget ripped by 50% in the cutbacks over the last few years. So their, their job is a difficult one. In a climate where funding gets prioritised to other sources, um, perhaps that indicates how little value the culture puts on this particular issue perhaps. Yes, please, go ahead. Thank you. Um, Anne Rigney. Um, I'm, well, there's obviously big practical financial issues at stake here, um, but nevertheless I'd like to ask a more perhaps theoretical question about the not notion of heritage and restoration, because clearly with the framing this house in terms of heritage and national trust, is already suggesting this idea of conservation. And, and I could imagine there's lots of um, money to be made from the film industry with things like Downton Abbey and this type of exploitation of these sort of heritage for very, very conservative uh, causes. But I was very struck in your, about in your, the example that you gave us uh, in the way in which the statue was being restored. Uh, it worked absolutely on me looking at the image with the colour, because I was asking my neighbour, hey, there's colour here, what's happening? So clearly it, it has this defamiliarising effect. At the same time, I was struck by the notion that the statue is being relocated to the... Um, uh, uh, Inside. To the glass house. Yes. Um, and thinking about the politics of space and, and how things are positioned, this suggests another sort of a move which might be hiding the statue rather than putting the statue in a more central place. Uh, which raises the question as to what, what is this sort of uh, the idea about uh, restoration and the possibilities of having a critical restoration, which the painting of the statue seems to suggest, uh, uh, as it's distinct from it putting it into the glass house, which may be a preservative practical measure, I'm not sure. But I'd be interested in hearing more generally your idea about this idea of critical restoration. Thank you. Yes, the putting it inside is a practical consideration because, unfortunately, lead is very valuable and the price has gone up enormously. And if we put it in the garden, we cannot guarantee its security. It would be stolen, melted down and sold for the value of the metal. So it can't go outside. But the advantage of putting it inside, because this conservatory is in a very central place in the garden, right beside the mansion, it means we can do other things with the statue. So that, for example, as it's inside, the sundial won't work. But the sundial is also very weathered. So I've asked the architects to elevate the statue so that instead of looking down on the statue, 
you look it in the eye. And I think that will have quite a dynamic about the way one would perceive the statue. I don't think a statue of that subject will ever have been put in that position, in that relationship to a viewer before. So the practicality of securing it inside the conservatory has meant that we can think other ways about how to display it. Now, the other difficulty is that in the heritage world, um, the, the language used in panels, used in interpretation boards, the text boards, is meant to be, so it can be understood by the reader of a tabloid newspaper, therefore it must be readable to somebody with a reading age of 12, so I'm told. And so that's going to, that's going to be a, a challenge in order to try to summarise, you know, the, the student painting of the statue in the 1980s and why, the origins of the statue and what it represents, the fact that the man who created the estate won the Asiento for Britain and that his income derived from slavery and the slave economy. There's a huge amount of material to convey to the viewer. And so, in a sense, you have to think about how to do it. With information at the statue, perhaps in a guidebook, and then maybe there's other sorts of information that one can do. I mean, there must be, I'm so old fashioned, but I believe you can do things through mobile phones, can't you? You can, <laughs> but, um, so it's, it, it, it's so important to contextualize the statue. And th this is something that, that we've committed ourselves to. And, 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 and again, it's gonna be fascinating to see what reception the statue has um, it'll be in position in two months' time. But don't you don't you think that it's it's it goes beyond uh, uh, contextualizing? Is it not also about telling stories it doesn't tell or hasn't told mm. yet? And um, um, is it not also about asking mm. people? Um, what should should it be about instead of us professionals yeah. uh, telling what we should read in it? And um, okay. I, I agree. I mean, I mean, um, we're, we're, this is the beginning of something for us. We have to work out all sorts of ways to develop it. But I think that you know, I I, I hardly dare use the, the term, but an outreach program. A, educational program, a community program, is going to be really very important. And another thing I'm disappointed about with the cutbacks is that there has been a project called the Bittersweet Project, which was about precisely that, about working with community groups, about trying to excavate their stories and getting their stories to have a purchase on the material culture of the heritage site that they were visiting. But so, in a sense, one has to start that again. Yes, or putting it uh, in the centre of uh, Kingston, Jamaica, for example. Mm. <laughs> well, uh, what would be? What I would, uh, I would dearly love to see the eleven other of these in gardens in England. I'd dearly love to say to, that the, uh, either the private owners or the institutional owners actually would actually say these are about the Atlantic slave trade, instead of just being absolutely silent. And indeed, e e even the histories of garden sculpture, which began at the height of empire, the first historians of garden sculpture were in the 1880s, 1890s, and they wax lyrical about Blackamoor statues because they are just beautiful decorative objects. They have a fine patina because of the weather. Mm. Nothing at all to do with what the sculpture actually represents. Do we have more questions? Yes, please. Thank you. Uh, my name is Domenica, and um, I have, well, it's, it's, a, it's a kind of reflection, more or less. I was triggered by, um, well, you, um, the, the, your reaction, Mr. Cipriani, was part of my question in a way. Um, do you ask further what's the narrative of the Moor? And could you leave the audience um, to, ask, 
to look at it and tell the story. Uh, who, who was this person? What happens after it? It has to do also with what, what Mr. Uh, Morris was also asking about there is a static notion of who the audience uh, is who is going to the garden. If we look at multicultural Britain or multicultural the Netherlands or, or, or France, um, the audience is also people who have had a, a, a heritage, maybe more or less of slavery, of migration, of identity, which makes the questioning and also the um, being present and looking at it gives a different dimension. And when we talk about um, being afraid that people might not come, I'm always fascinated by the Holocaust museums we have around Europe. And also the way we are never afraid that there will not be people going mm. there. If you see what's happening to Berlin or many places around Europe, there is always interest. It has to do how do you market it? Is it being perceived as being our common history in which we are responsible? And who should uh, embrace it as being a responsible common history? And how do we go about it? Because as long as we have this seizure and we don't see it as a continuum, as Professor, Professor Verger was saying, then we keep it separated. So I don't know who is responsible, but I think we have to go further and also look at with our uh, common history at the moment we are sending now, looking back and also how do you look and give space to the narrative. So that was my reflection. You Thank you very much. Point? No, well, that was, yes, no, I mean, uh, it, it, that, that kind of response is so helpful. It just, it, it, it reminds me of how much work we'll have to do in the ongoing years. Now we've made the decision to restore the statue to the garden. You can't just put it there. You've got to use it as a dynamic. I will need to finish up this, this part, and I would like to ask um, your indulgence for me just to give a few thoughts, um, maybe also for the rest of the afternoon. Uh, I think that we started, we started with the Treaty of Utrecht, um, with uh, putting the question, what was it really? Was it an act of peace, or was it something else, or was it something more than just signing of a treaty between a few countries? Uh, and when talking about that, I think that we um, really plugged into the complexity of the issue that we're talking about. And a lot of uh, issues came forward that I would just like to mention, uh, in my opinion. Uh, one issue is the uh, issue about inf um, the difference between giving information and thinking about the meaning of it. I think that when we are all indulging in our academic work, we really should consider and thinking about a question um, are we just gathering information or are we also interested in looking into what it really means? And, and um, in speaking about that issue, the other issue comes up, the issue of voice and the issue of audience and maybe the issue of perspective. Whose perspective, whose narrative, whose story, whose history, who is telling the story? And maybe there is also the question or the issue also came forward of the legacy. What is it really what is left? Um, which part of the legacy is here in Europe? Which part of the legacy is there in the colonized uh, countries? Um, which part of the legacy is political? Which part is colonial? Which part is psychological? So how do we understand really the legacy? And how do we understand our attitude towards legacy? And, um, and I think to, to finish um, my view on this, that I think that one thing stood out very clear this afternoon, and that is that we really cannot uh, approach the Treaty of Utrecht as a very simple act of signing a uh, treaty. I think there's a very, very strong interconnectedness between the treaty itself, slavery, slave trade, colonialism, and contemporary impact of all that history, which is still very much alive. Thank you so much for your participation.